So let's start. I thought I'd just better tell you who I am. As you can tell, I'm not from around here. I'm Australian. Uh, got my first couple of degrees in Australia, went to Canada, uh, got my surgical specialisation in Canada, then went to the UK and lived in uh, Edinburgh for at, Michi at uh, the Royal Dick School of Veterinary Studies at, uh, in Edinburgh. It was my first faculty appointment, got my uh, British and European specialisation and then uh, went down to England, Cambridge University and about 80, almost 18 years ago now came to Michigan State University uh, where I have been ever since. I'm a specialist surgeon, I uh, only do soft tissue, I don't do any orthopaedics, I let the boys do that. Actually there's a couple of girls in the team as well but you know orthopaedic surgeons are a little different. Um, <coughs> I mean that in the nicest possible way. Uh, so I'm actually head of the whole surgery team there, which means there's 12 specialist surgeons, some of whom are orthopaedic, so it's quite a difficult job. Uh, six residents, a couple of research associates at any one time, and seven uh, operating nurses. Uh, we have a huge veterinary medical centre at Michigan State University. There's over 50 faculty, we have 130 staff, we see 26,000 cases a year, and, um, and on my service I see 2,000 uh, cases a year and I do a lot of talking and, um, and travelling as well. Um, I do a lot of clinical research and my clinical research interests, as you will hear, uh, obviously in upper airway, which I'm very interested in. Uh, I also uh, am interested in wound healing and uh, cutaneous reconstruction. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about today, let me know if I'm blocking your view at all, okay? I'll try and move around a little bit. Uh, is I just want to start off by going over a little bit of anatomy, just so that you understand what the upper air, when we talk about the larynx and we talk about the pharynx and we talk about the nasal turbinates, that you know hard palate, soft palate, you know exactly what we're referring to. Then I'll talk about actually what we know about the syndrome, the Norwich Terrier upper airway syndrome. And then I'll tell you what we don't know about it. And then I'll tell you what it isn't and what people, uh, especially vets I should say, have, have often sort of likened it to, uh, and it very definitely is not that. I think the batteries might be going on my... Okay, um, and then I'll just finish up by, because I know it's not part of the study, but I know you'll all be interested in some of the current therapies and, and uh, what we can do to manage these. Do you want to see if we can just get that? I think the batteries must be going. And I will speak very loudly, so it doesn't really matter if I have a microphone or not. And then there'll be plenty of time at the end for um, questions and comments, and I really would in invite you to, to uh, give me your opinions and any questions you have, because although we have the grant and we've pretty well finalised the protocol, there's always room for a little shuffling before we actually start uh, recruiting and enrolling our first study subject. Um, I hope you've all seen that we have actually got a brochure uh, up available and uh, I did actually bring uh, some, a few informed consent forms which I'll just start passing around so that you can have a look at them while I'm talking. So these are just the, what the informed consent forms are going to look like. Jane, you've probably already seen them. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so as I talk about the study, this is what... Okay, okay, there we go. There we go. Oh, I've run out. <laughs> okay. <coughs> All right. So let's talk about uh, upper airway uh, anatomy and just do a quick review or a quick uh, learning of, of the upper airway. And so we'll talk about the nares. Uh, so if I say nares by mistake, just I mean nostrils, but sometimes I say nares. The nasal cavity. We'll talk about the pharynx, the larynx, and I won't really talk about the trachea because your dogs have good tracheas on the whole. Okay, so the nose, this is a normal nose here, okay? This is what uh, a normal nostrils look like in most mesopecephalic dogs and I believe most Norwich Terriers as well. And we'll look at some other noses later on. Now the nose is actually a little bit more complicated than just being the nares, thanks, but uh, because it has a whole lot of different cartilages in underneath that planum nasale, the little black bit, uh, that can actually be deformed and, and thickened and, and misshapen. But 
I don't think this is an area to concentrate on very much with the, with the Norwich Terriers, though we will be documenting them and measuring them. Behind the actual uh, nostrils and that na planum nasale, we have the nose. And within the nose cavity, uh, and this is really important, there is, um, it's full of cartilage. And this is a CT that's a cross-sectional CT. And then this is a cadaver that has been cross-sectioned at a little bit of the same level, rough, in fact, exactly the same level. And you can see that it's not just an empty uh, cavity in there. It's full of cartilaginous scrolls, and that's all covered with mucosa. So you can see that the air gets filtered, and uh, as it flows through there, and the lamina flow away, gets filtered. And then right at the very back, there is, um, which I'll show you in a minute, there is the olfactory mucosa, which is very uh, strong in the dog. So um, if now we look at, uh, I, I drew this last night when I was watching Donald Trump on the television. <laughs> oh my God. So I was concentrating on this more than Donald Trump. And, uh, and this is just a cross section in the midline. So there's a lot of things that aren't included like the tonsils and things like that, but just in the midline of a dog. And so you can see right on the left hand side, you've got the planum nasale or the, or the nostrils. And then the turbinates are in the nasal cavity. And the actually olfactory mucosa is right up here quite a way behind and up high of the nasal cavity, not really part of the air, you know, the main airflow. And then <clears throat> as you go further back, the division, initially the division between the nasal cavity and the oral cavity, the mouth, is bone, where that wriggly bit where it says hard palate, that's bone covered with mucosa. As you go further back, it becomes, there's no bone in it, okay? So it's the soft palate instead of the hard palate. And if you stick your finger in the back of your mouth, and you put your finger up onto your soft palate, you'll sort of gag a little bit, you know? So that's, and dogs do too. It's a very gaggy area. Um, and then there's courses, there's the tongue. And then what's, what's really difficult to sort of think about is the pharynx. So if you think of the nasal cavity and the oral cavity, and you go back to where the soft palate is, that's the pharynx. So above the soft palate is the nasopharynx, below the soft palate is the oropharynx, and further back, as you get into the larynx, it's called the laryngopharynx. And I want you to take a special attention to this part here, which is the dorsal wall of the pharynx. Because a lot of times that, um, that wall can be redundant in the Norwich. Uh, and then behind, right at the back of the throat, behind the soft palate, you have the larynx. And we'll, we'll talk about the larynx uh, in the next slide. Does that all make sense? Okay, good. Now the larynx is sitting, as you can see here, right at the top of the trachea, and the trachea is the windpipe. And actually what I should have mentioned is this is the windpipe where the dog breathes in and out, and this is the esophagus. So it's kind of weird because the air comes in the nose, because dogs are more or less nasal breathers, even though they're pantless just to cool. As far as breathing, they breathe through their nose mostly. And it goes through the nose and it comes down into the larynx and down to the trachea. When they eat, it goes into the mouth and then it comes up through the pharynx into the food pipe. It's called the pharyngeal chiasma and I don't agree with it. And when I die and go to heaven, I'm going to have a little word with uh, somebody up there and just say, this is a bad design. I would have designed it a little different. And they'll probably come back and say, well, this is why we did this, Bryden. And I'll say, fine, good idea. All right then. So the larynx itself, now this is the, this is the structure that I absolutely love, this larynx sits at the top of the windpipe. And this is a, um, a plasticized model, but it's pretty realistic. And there are five cartilages in there and they're all covered in mucosa. And let me just name the cartilages for you. There's the epiglottis, which is right at the front. And it's like a trap door, okay? It, when it goes back to close the larynx, it's passive. It comes, it's at the base of the tongue, if you remember where that tongue was. So it all closes, there's nothing that closes that epiglottis any other way. There is a little muscle that opens it, but don't worry about that. Um, then there's the thyroid cartilage, and the thyroid is this U-shaped cartilage that has these wings around the side of it. And I always think of it as sort of hugging or snuggling the rest of the laryngeal cartilage is in there. It's a very robust, strong cartilage. Then right at the back you have um, the cricoid cartilage, which is the last cartilage before you get into the, the trachea. And there's quite a few attachments from the other cartilages there. It's a very solid structure as well. And then, then there are these two paired paired uh, cartilages called the arytenoids, 
right at the rostral or the front end of the uh, larynx. So there's one on the left and one on the right. And they're weird shaped. They actually have four processes. There's the corniculate, the cuneiform, the muscular and the vocal <coughs> process. Weird shaped cartilage sits right at the front of the cartilage. And that's the one that uh, shuts really firmly when, uh, when an animal is consciously trying to close its, uh, its larynx. So in the, that part, that hole where those uh, pink arotenoids are is called the remoglottitis or the glottis, minor differentiation in, in terms. And that's the narrowest part of the larynx. And that is the bit that's really critical to not get obstructed. The bottom part, below those pink parts you can't see in this model, are the vocal folds. And they go from the, from the vocal process here of the arotenoid down to the bottom of the uh, thyroid cartilage, the vocal folds. Just in front of the vocal folds <coughs> are the laryngeal saccules. Now the function of the larynx is very important. And luckily, Norwich Terriers have a very functional larynx that works very, very well. Um, and, and the functions are that they have to be able to close it so that they can cough uh, or increase their abdominal pressure when they defecate or have, uh, you know, going to parturition or have, uh, you know, going to, uh, it's not, uh, I, I can only think of parturition, but you can't, or whelping, yeah, right. I was going to say childbirth, but that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> So when they, when they uh, undergo parturition or whelping, um, they, uh, they need it to vocalise properly. Uh, very important, that whole remoglottitis and the whole larynx. So if you just look at it, this is actually a cadaveric, so a cadaver uh, that's been dissected, the larynx has been dissected out. And what I'm pointing to there are the corniculate processes of the uh, arotenoids. So this is the arotenoids and this is what you'll see when you look at it through the mouth with the endoscope, or what you should see. And then as you come down, these are the cuneiform processes of the arotenoids. It's all arotenoids. And then right down there, at the bottom side of it, are the vocal folds. And just in front of these vocal folds, you can't see them because they're sort of, they're outpouched, which is what they should be, are the saccules. And all, these dog, all dogs have saccules except for one breed, and that's the Basenji. And, uh, and it helps them, we think, vocalise and, and have some sort of uh, resonance to their bark. But who knows? All right, so this is what it looks like when you're looking at a live uh, animal through its mouth, right at the back of the throat. And what you can see up here uh, is the soft palate, okay? This is the epiglottis where the light probe is in there. And when we do a laryngeal exam, we look at a lot of other structures around the larynx. We look at these piriform recesses and the velleculae and everything, but just these are just the important bits. Uh, and so, it, so this is the epiglottis and it's sort of coming forward, remember? These are those cuneiform cartilages. This is a normal larynx. And you can just see a little bit of the vocal folds there. A nice, good remoglottitis there. You can see that the corniculate cartilages are coming up here. They're being hidden a little bit by the soft palate. Does that all make sense then? That little review of anatomy? Okay, so now let's look at um, Norwich Terrier Upper Airway Syndrome, which is a very exciting condition because it is quite unique. You all know that um, you know, it's an upper airway condition and it's characterised by noisy breathing. And it's really variable. It can vary, vary from quite, being quite mild to severe respiratory distress. And breeders have been aware of this condition for a long time. Veterinarian, veterinarians have been appallingly ignorant of it for probably just as long time. The signs are raspy or gurgly breathing. They may snore. They can have difficulty breathing. They may have a decreased ability to exercise. They're heat intolerant. And they're inconsistently reported as, having, as getting worse when it's stressed or excitement or, or heat. Uh, and, and that's an interesting thing in the questionnaires that I can point out later as well. And of course, they can die. And this little dog here is in an oxygen cage. I think that's uh, not a video. Okay. All right. So, um, <coughs> what we see when we do an endoscopic exam with Norwich Terrier upper airway syndrome 
is we see redundant tissues in front of the larynx. So instead of seeing the nice, clear, sharp cuneiform cartilages and uh, corniculate processes of the arotenoids, we see this sort of spongy, redundant tissue. We call it supraarotenoid mucosa or supraarotenoid tissue. It's really characteristic of just the Norwich Terrier. The only thing that's anything like it is laryngomalacia in children. Um, we see deviated uh, or, or covered laryngeal cartilages. And then this dog here, you can see that these are the cuneiforms. One's deviated down here, one's deviated up there. They're not even anymore. And the corniculate cartilages, you can barely see because of all of this redundant tissue. They still function. I mean, they're not paralyzed, but, uh, but they've just got this redundant tissue and they find it more difficult to function. Um, they have a narrowed opening. Uh, behind the vocal folds, or oh, I should say, sorry, this is a normal one at the bottom for you to compare. And they will often, sometimes, have a redundant dorsal pharyngeal wall. Remember I told you about that dorsal part of the pharynx, the top, top part of the pharynx. Every now and then they'll have a mildly elongated soft palate. They tend to have large tonsils, the Norwiches that I've seen so far. And uh, but the nares are normal and the nasal cavity is normal based on the CTs that we have done and the scoping that we've done. <coughs> and the nares, the nostrils. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so this is just showing you the redundant supraarotenoid tissues. This is showing you the deviated cuneiform cartilages. And then, of course, we have the saccules right there in the middle that are sticking out, as you can see there. So let's look at a video of this same dog. <coughs> and you can see, in a minute you'll be able to see that he can actually move his larynx. What we do is we induce them under a light plane of anesthesia, usually our Faxalone or Propofol, and then we give them a drug that stimulates their breathing even though they're unconscious, uh, and it's called doxapram hydrochloride. So they take breaths while they're asleep, and then we can see if they're paralyzed or not. And you can see he's moving, and that, you don't need to see a lot of movement, but he is not paralyzed. But can you see as he's moving that sort of loose, sort of almost gelatinous uh, tissue at the top there, and the, the saccules at the bottom there? This dog had actually had his saccules removed about a week before, but I don't think they were completely <laughs> removed. So, and they often have quite a bit of phlegm there as well. So you can see the drug has kicked in now. It's his tongue. Don't worry about his tongue there. Okay. And then what we see once we go behind, and I'll show you in a minute on the scope, when we go behind that uh, where the saccules are and the vocal folds are, there's a narrowing of the larynx, this keyhole shape to the larynx. So this is a normal dog on the left. Unfortunately, both of these dogs have got their tubes in, but uh, endotracheal tubes under anesthesia but we, we will have more that won't um, uh, once we start the study. But you can see that is a pretty uh, oval type of uh, uh, larynx. This is the, when we say infraglottic, it means behind the glottis, or subglottic, you know, behind the glottis itself. Whereas this little Norwich Terrier has got this sort of keyhole shape. <coughs> so let's have a look. So there's a big tonsil for you. There's another big tonsil for you. And so this is a young dog and he's not really clinical. He's got redundant dorsal pharyngeal wall there. Oh, we're just looking at the tissues on either side for, that for, the, for those redundant tissues. And you can see them there on either side. They're not bad, but they're definitely not normal. Just got a bubble on the scope. There we go. And there's the other side. Just having a good look at it. <laughs> it's important to see that because if they regurgitate, the esophagus is right at the top there. And if they regurgitate, it goes down into those, they're called piriform recesses on either side. It's important. So there you can see. Now there's the keyhole, you see? Yeah. And then we go into the trachea, and the trachea is just beautiful usually. I think the worst tracheal collapse I've ever seen in these dogs is a grade one. <laughs> so there's the keyhole again. And this is just, you can see his saccules aren't everted, but you can see them there. 
They're not everted, but they're what we call effaced. Underneath, we look at the vellicule as well. That's underneath the epiglottis and so forth. This is another dog that's 11 years old and is clinical. In other words, when I say clinical or non-clinical, is showing signs or is not showing signs. So that's the epiglottis we're seeing. We're using a little Q-tip just to lift up the soft palate there. Sometimes they cough a bit so when you lift up their soft palate. There was a little cough there. And we're just having a look in here. This dog has, has his saccules removed, but you can see the, there's still some tissue there and you can see the um, keyhole. We'll see it in a minute. Again, we're looking at the redundant tissue on either side and you see how it's sort of all sort of puffy. It's got quite a bit of phlegm there as well. And we go over to the other side and have a look. It's, and it's really spongy when you look at it. And you can see at the top there how you can't really see those lovely corniculate processes there because they're, they're covered with this redundant tissue. And then I wanted to just check and see if this was scar tissue or if this was just spit and, uh, or phlegm. And it, it was phlegm. I think I change out to a finer Q-tip in a minute, to a micro Q-tip. And then you can see very clearly that that is a little bit of uh, recurrent saccule, but the rest of it, it's not stuck together. It's not scar tissue. You can see the keyhole right there, how clearly it is there. It's really interesting, this this narrowing behind the, the glottis. Does that all make sense? Can you see that? Okay, there's the fine Q-tip and you can see we're just taking out the, the phlegm there. There's that keyhole. And then we usually do the trachea by going right down to the carina and then coming backwards and I'm just showing you the portion where's the where there's the keyhole there. And this is what they sound like. This was a particularly bad dog. This was actually the first Norwich that I ever saw. She's in an oxygen cage there. And this is what she looked like on video. And look at those cuneiform cartilages, they're overlapping. Her airway, you can hardly see where her airway is at all here then. We did a permanent tracheostomy on this dog. I'll show you her in a little bit. Once we get into her trachea, she's got the keyhole shape there. It's a bit out of focus, sorry. But once we get into her trachea, it's, uh, it's pretty good. It's a little blurry, but it's pretty good. That would be a grade one tracheal collapse, which I'm sure is secondary to her larynx. So that's probably about the worst that I've seen thus far. I'll show you her after surgery later on. <coughs> so that's, that's what we have in the Norwich Terrier. Now, what do we actually know about the upper airway syndrome? Well, a lot, well, a reasonable amount has been written in the breeder gazettes and in the, um, and the newsletters and so forth, which really documented quite well. But in the peer-reviewed literature, there's hardly anything. In 2013, Linnell Johnson, who's actually going to be a part of the study group, which is great, she's a good friend of mine as well. She's an internist, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, she'll, <laughs> she'll love it. The, the, um, so she, she looked at 16 dogs. This was a great paper. She looked at 16 dogs, um, some of which were clinical, some of which weren't clinical. In other words, some had signs, some didn't have signs. 12 out of them had, of 16 had averted saccules. 12 of 16 had this redundant supraarotenoid, this redundant tissue in front of the larynx. 11 of them had laryngeal collapse. And the first sign of laryngeal collapse is actually everted saccules. 
And then 12 out of the 16 had a narrowed infraglottic, infraglottic lumen, that keyhole shape behind the glottis. So, and, and she, you know, said this is really interesting, we should do something about it. Uh, and then in 2014, Koch uh, did a study looking at 23, but all he was looking at was, uh, or the, that's not true, the main thing he was looking at were skull indices, which is based on radiographs. And he looked at um, these 23 Norwich Terror skull indices and compared them to just a few brachycephalic and mesotecephalic. So brachycephalic are the, are the short nosed breeds and mesotecephalic is sort of like a normal nose breed. And uh, as opposed to a dolico, really long uh, nosed breed. And based on one of those three skull <coughs> indices, so this is the S index, the uh, length to width and the craniofacial angle, um, based on one of those skull indices and their ease measurements, um, he, and the rhino rhinomanometry, the, he said the breed was tending towards brachyce brachycephaly. In other words, the reason that we were seeing these laryngeal changes is because um, the breed was becoming uh, brachycephalic, which is kind of an interesting um, conclusion. And you'll see why he came to that when I talk about brachycephalic disease in a minute. But the thing is that the upper airway all of the changes in the larynx in a brachycephalic breed is, is due to, are due to the upper, the nose and the nares and the palate. And the Norwich Terriers have a pretty well normal nares and nasal cavity and, and palate compared to these brachycephalic breeds. So kind of an interesting um, conclusion. All 23 did have abnormal laryngoscopy findings, but they weren't clearly described, which is a shame. Um, so we, we did some preliminary uh, work when we were writing the grant so that we had, you know, it's always good when you're writing a grant to show that you've got some preliminary data uh, to support your hypotheses and so forth. And uh, so we actually had 39 dogs, but, but they're incomplete data. Some of them are just like videos from, you know, Europe and so forth. And, and th but we have 39 on our enrollment log, but it's not for the actual study. It's just, just dogs that we're collecting. Um, we actually have six dogs that we've done CT and endoscopy, and we've seen no abnormalities of the nares, either the external or the internal nares, and that's a different thing, uh, or the nasal cavity. Um, and we've done 17 dogs, actually we've done more now, but we did seven at that time when we were writing the grant, 17 dogs which we had good endoscopic data on. And, uh, and what we found here was very similar to what Linnell Johnson found, uh, which is that uh, there were five clinical, 12 non-clinical, and we found exactly the same on our physical exam, which was good, uh, but it was a non-exercised physical exam. We didn't run them up and down. Uh, and the interesting thing is that we, look, we looked at a number of things in the oral cavity, like, uh, you know, the tonsils, were they inflamed? Was the mucosa, uh, you know, looking inflamed or reddened? Was there a lot of phlegm in there? Was the palate elongated? Was the dorsal pharyngeal wall uh, redundant? Was the epiglottis deformed? Um, was there redundant, you know, that excessive supraarytenoid tissues? Uh, and so forth. Were the laryngeal saccules effaced or partially averted or fully averted? And was there infraglottic narrowing? And what we found really marked was that just nearly all dogs, whether they were clinical or not clinical, had uh, some sort of saccule eversion, whether it was effacement or partially averted or fully averted, and, and almost all of them had uh, this infraglottic narrowing. Now, some of the others had, you know, they had uh, quite a lot had these redundant arytenoid mucosal tissues, um, quite a lot had the dorsal pharyngeal wall mucosa, and what we should have done is taken that back to weight, which you will do in, the, in this study, look at the body condition score of these animals at the same time. Uh, and a few had these elongated soft palates, but they were just between five and eight millimetres long. Nothing was more than eight millimetres long, which is really not even worth getting out of bed to cut um, if, it's that, if it's that small. So, we know a little bit. What we don't know, first of all, we don't know the true prevalence of the condition in the breed. We don't know how variable it is within the breed, which is what a big thing about this study will, will let us know. And is it consistent? Are the changes consistent? Which I suspect they will be, seeing 
you know, what we've seen so far with these cases. And if they are consistent, if it is a consistent what we call phenotype, in other words the presentation of the condition is very similar within a range in each dog, then it's more likely that it's going to be um, you know, caused by one or two or more gene mutations, which is great because then we can test for them. What about the age of onset? You know, is it congenital? Are they born with it? Is it a juvenile onset condition like laryngomalacia in children? Or is it a late onset condition? Or is it a combination of these? Does it progress? I mean, we probably think it does, but have we actually documented that it does progress over time? Is there an underlying gene mutation? Is there a heritability component? And if so, what is the mode of inheritance? Why is it in the Norwich and not in the Norfolk when they used to be the same breed such a long time ago? Is it similar to a human condition? So this little guy says um, this needs to be clarified and he can't speak properly because he's got a stick in his mouth. And I should tell you the number of pharyngeal stick injuries that I've taken out of a dog. <laughs> okay, so we've looked at the upper airway anatomy. We've looked at what it is. Let's look at what it isn't. Are there any questions so far? Yeah. Yes. Seventeen out of seventeen. Oh, of of Linnells. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so maybe these were very young dogs. I don't know. Yeah. yeah that's what she saw. Yeah. We. Yeah. So it. Yeah. It, it isn't. It isn't always there. And, and I think what this study will show is, I don't know, but we'll see, maybe in the young dogs it, it doesn't go there. It's, it's never completely normal though. They're never as clearly defined as in a young brachycephalic or is in a completely normal mesotecephalic dog. But, yeah. I do think it's very variable. But the changes are in the same area, the same tissues all the time. Yes. I will. I should... I should do that. The question was, were, were, are the supraarytenoid tissues variable uh, as well? Because they seem to be not that high in the Linnell Johnson study. Was there another question? Yeah. Yeah, I thought that Chris Hagen, her study of the Norwich and Norfolk, she looked at the Norfolk, and some of them were not normal either. Right. They seem to have signs of. Right, great comment. So the comment was that when Chris Zink did her study on her um, labour of love, the post-mortem study, and she's actually on this uh, study group as well, that she found um, very young, first of all she found changes v in very young Norwich Terriers, as young as I think two days some of them were, um, and, but then she also found some Norwiches that seemed to have similar laryngi, I mean sorry, Norfolks that seemed to have uh, similar laryngies, but it's not a problem clinically in Norfolks as far as I understand, is that correct? Mm. I don't think so. We've never had the same problems in the right. So Interesting. Which is why we're going to look at some Norfolks. Right. Yeah, one more question. The next study was the 39 dogs, and a lot of them are very young. Do I, do I remember that a lot of them were like less than three weeks old? You mean Chris Zink's one? Yes. Yes, some of them were very young. Postmortem? Yes. Yeah, I unrelated. The death was unrelated to upper airway. Okay. Okay. She she hasn't published that yet. Yeah. Interesting. So there's quite a lot that we don't know. Oh. Yeah. Right. So the question was that Norwiches and Norfolks were from the same, that's the whole thing, they were from the same stock originally and I've spoken to a few people, we should discuss this at the end as to uh, what I'd really love to find out is when it was first recognised in the Norwich, or Norwich, I don't know what you call it. Yeah, but no, but it's not, so the question was is the, is the narrowing, the infraglottic narrowing functional. Yeah, I mean, I think it's causing turbulence and edema, but it's not cartilage, because we can see that from the CT. It appears to be tissue. 
what we need to do is to biopsy that tissue. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. All right, let's talk about what it isn't. And I'm just going to whiz through this pretty quickly. The two things that um, vets seem to come up with because they're not aware of the Norwich Terrier problem <coughs> is that it's laryngeal paralysis or brachycephalic airway syndrome. And this is, you know, I see three or four laryngeal paralyses a week and I see probably the same dogs with brachycephalic airway syndromes. I've done research on both of these extensively. So I know these two diseases inside out, which is why I was so blown away when I read Linnell's article and then saw my first uh, Norwich Terrier. So first of all, laryngeal paralysis is the, the loss of the nerve supply to the muscles of the larynx, to all of them actually, except maybe one muscle, the cricothyroidus, which is innervated by another nerve, but don't worry about that. And so it cannot close or open. It's just flaccid and it just hangs there, you know, like curtains in a window. So when the dog breathes in, it sucks it together. When the dog grows out, it goes like that. Okay, it's completely and flaccidly paralyzed. And that leads to air turbulence, which leads to a bit of swelling, of course, because any turbulence in the respiratory mucosa leads to this massive swelling response. And of course, if it's swollen, then they get more obstruction. And if they can't breathe because they're obstructed, of course, they panic, they get air hungry and they go <gasps> And so they make these huge inspiratory efforts, which you know, completely collapse it down. The best drug we can give these dogs with laryngeal paralysis is actually ACE. We actually sedate them heavily. And nine times out of 10, um, they don't need it. They, they're, they're zonked and they don't need as much air and they're actually fine until we can work them up and take them to surgery. And that one time out of 10, then we just take them to surgery. Anyhow, there are many causes of laryngeal paralysis and there's uh, congenital causes, um, there's a juvenile onset causes, there's causes that are associated with a, um, a severe polyneuropathy like in the Leon Burger and in the Bernese and in the um, uh, um, St. Bernard and in the Bouvier de Flandre. And th this is a whole different lot. The, the most common one, about 85% of what we see, probably 90% of what I see, probably 95% of what I see because it's my research area, is what we call geriatric onset laryngeal paralysis polyneuropathy. And that's the old Labrador that comes in going <laughs> <laughs> And the most common procedure we do with that, it's actually a slowly progressing polyneuropathy, but for immediate respiratory relief, we do a tieback procedure or a cricoarotenoid laryngeplasty. And that's the common surgery we do with that. And what we do is we open up one side here. <clears throat> now, if we did that in a Norwich Terrier, we've got all this tissue here. And if the, remember, the esophagus is just here. So if they reflux or regurge, and it can't go down here into the piriform recess, it's going to go straight in there and they're going to aspirate. So I don't think this is good technique for the, for the Norwich Terrier. So let me show you. This is a normal laryngeal function. So you can see. He's had the respiratory drug and you can see when he breathes in, he opens up and when he relaxes even, it's still a little bit open, you know, even when he's relaxed, it's still a bit open. Okay. It should never be closed. Is it? I mean, oh, absolutely. When they're so swallowing, well, I mean, when, when they're, they're not when they're breathing, no, that's what I meant. but when, yeah, no, when they're swallowing, they snap it closed. In fact, right, most of the I muscles snap it shut. Yeah, it's that's a good question, is when it should be open and closed. So when they're coughing, they, when you cough, you go, <coughs> so you close it and then you open it suddenly. Most of the muscles of the larynx close it. There's only one muscle that opens it. And so, um, the, and the other time is when you're <coughs> straining, then you close your larynx, you're closing your uh, glottis. But when you're breathing, when you're breathing, not so much us, because we use it because we talk, but when a dog is breathing just normally, it probably just rests a little bit open. Okay, now when they're um, doing a little bit more walking around and sniffing and everything, when they're breathing in, it goes open and then it relaxes. In, open, relax. When they're running around maximally or chasing a rabbit, it's just wide open the whole time. Okay, so here is a laryngeal paralysis case. I'll straighten it up in a minute. Oh, which way to straighten it? Oh, other way. There we go. Now you can see, see how it flutters there? That's the dog breathing out. So all you can see is a flutter and that's just because he's breathing out and it's flapping in the breeze. Sometimes you'll see actually paradoxical motion and they'll actually, when they breathe in, they suck it together. There's absolutely no movement there. Sometimes you see little fasciculations, which is a sign of denervation. 
Okay, so it's not laryngeal paralysis. Okay, all the Norwiches that we've examined endoscopically, we've given doxapram, and their laryngeas work fine. Thank goodness, too. So it's great. Another thing that it isn't, I believe, is brachycephalic airway syndrome. And let me tell you why I think this is the case. This is a, is a mesotecephalic dog. Pretty similar, I'd imagine, to a, a Norwich Terrier, actually. And of course, as you know, does anybody here have brachycephalics? Yeah, I've got one too. They're so bloody cute, aren't they? But, you know, what we've actually bred is a disaster because um, we foreshortened the muzzle, that maxilla, that upper jaw there has been foreshortened. But unfortunately, all of the, the uh, nasal cartilages, remember those tightly scrolled cartilages covered with mucosa? That's all postnatal growth. And, um, and they still grow as if they're going to grow into a, a medium-sized snout. So they're all crammed there incredibly, and they have very poor um, oxygen flow through their nose. In addition to that, they have redundant, let's show you the two. So they have these, they have this, um, they have thickened and stenotic nares. So they have an abnormal mucosal development with a lot of mucus producing cells as well. So again, that's a normal nostril, okay. Um, and this is a, a brachycephalic, typical brachycephalic uh, nostrils. They have an elongated and a thickened soft palate. And their whole, their whole mucosa, especially in English bulldogs, is really thickened. I mean, I love them, but you know, they are genetic nightmares. <laughs> They've been hit by the genetic bus. <laughs> um, so, and they have, they have in their nasal turbinates, they come right back. Now remember, if you remember that, that uh, sagittal, the, uh, that sort of cut through the middle section, None of those turbinates should go back into the nasopharynx. They shouldn't go back over the top of the soft palate. The nasopharynx should be a nice, clear passage. Well, they have abnormal turbinates coming right back in there, very, very commonly. This is a normal one, and these are called the coani, or the internal nostrils, or neri. And this is what they look like when they're abnormal. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Um, and within their actual nasal cavity, they've got a lot of mucosal contact points. In other words, it's all jammed together and smooshed up against each other. Additionally, which is actually part of the study that we're going to do on brachycephalics, they've got macroglossia. They've all got really big tongues. So all of that leads to upper airway resistance from their, from their nostrils right down to their pharynx. Okay, so they've got elongated soft palate. They've got all these smooshed up. So if you just hold your nose and breathe in, you can feel the tension in your larynx pushing it in because you're, you're, you're expanding your chest to breathe in against the closed upper airway and it puts a lot of negative strain on that larynx. And the larynx is only hyaline cartilage. And so the secondary changes that you see with brachycephalic airway syndrome, this is where the confusion arises. It's due to this nasal and pharyngeal obstruction but the secondary changes can be somewhat similar to the inexperienced eye to the Norwich Terriers. And I think this is why people have latched onto brachycephalic disease. Because the first thing that happens is those laryngeal saccules pop out into the airway. Now this is a brachycephalic dog. It's not a um, Norwich Terrier. And you can tell that because he hasn't got any redundant airways here, uh, redundant tissue there. <coughs> So um, they also get other laryngeal collapse. They get further laryngeal collapse, which I haven't seen in the Norwich Terrier. Um, and they get, well, the Norwich Terrier. What, what they can get, the brachycephalic dogs, is that these cuneiforms can become medially displaced. And that's because they're being sucked in. When you see that in the Norwich Terriers, when they are medially displaced, it's because they're sort of being pushed in by all this redundant tissue on the outside. It's very spongy, that tissue. And they get pulmonale, which is a large right side of the heart, which I won't go into. They can also get hiatal hernia too, which I won't go into. And uh, so the changes actually appear different, but you can see where the confusion arises. You go in and you say, oh, inverted saccules, take them out, he'll be better. He must be becoming, it must be a brachycephalic, it must be almost brachycephalic. I can really see how that would happen. Okay, so that's what it, what it is and what it isn't. I'd like to spend 
the rest of us, the rest of today, apart from just a little bit about therapy at the end, talking about the study, <coughs> which is now funded. <laughs> so we have quite a few people on the study. Um, uh, so there's myself, I'm the project director and the principal investigator at Michigan State. And because I want to do nasal impedance, I've got Dr. Nathan Nelson, who's the most brilliant young diagnostic imaging person I know, and he's at Michigan State as well. Um, Linnell Johnson at UC Davis. Uh, Kelly Thiemann at uh, Texas A&M. Eric Monet, who's just joined um, at, the, at Colorado State University. And then I have some pathologists, Christy Mitelka at Michigan State and Christine Zink, who was at Johns Hopkins, is going to be involved. And then because um, I've got to have an anesthesiology, uh, anesthesiologist close by, I have Sheila Robertson, who's a fantastic anesthesiologist. Stephen Kerry, internal medicine, that does a lot of respiratory impedance work. His PhD was in that. Um, Jeffrey Schonebeck is the uh, geneticist who's now at Roslyn Center, very keen to be involved. He doesn't have funds to do the, G, uh, the GWAS or the genetic studies right now, but where, where I'll, I'll be extracting DNA and, and banking it along with the pedigrees so that he, when he gets funding, we can just send it over to him. And then I have a couple of recent graduates that are helping, Jennifer Strauss, who was at the Kentucky meeting with me. She's now an intern at Texas A&M. And then Grace Lowey, who is uh, a graduate research associate with me, and will be doing a lot of the, the grunt work. And of course, um, also on the team, we have the Norwich Terrier Club of America, a very eclectic group of people. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and of course, all the breeders and owners that are going to be part of the study, uh, as well as the Norfolk Terrier owners and breeders that I'm hoping will be a part of the study, and of course, the dogs. And, uh, who are just wonderful. And I should say right now that everybody that has come across these dogs has fallen in love with them. Even the printer who printed this, <laughs> printed this brochure apparently came into the PR th place at Michigan State and said, I love these dogs. I want to get one. I said, oh, I could put you in touch with a few people. <laughs> so <laughs> he obviously didn't read it very closely. <laughs> I still felt like saying, wait a year, and then we will. <laughs> but, uh, so, so it's all part of a big team, which I'll talk about again at the end. So our goals, we have four main goals. In fact, we have two main goals and, and two secondary goals. Our first goal is to develop a standardised, a really accurate standardised severity grading protocol that vets can use and breeders can use. And this is going to be um, uh, developed by performing uh, a detailed questionnaire of enrolled subjects a detailed uh, physical examination, detailed upper airway endoscopy in 150 Norwich Terriers. And I'll talk about that goal in a minute. Then we're going to, uh, the secondary uh, goal, second goal is to compare head and neck CT images between Norwich Terriers and Norfolk Terriers. And then I have another study going, which is looking at brachycephalic and mesotecephalic dogs. And we're looking at nasal impedance and CT images and uh, I think this will be these dovetail, these two studies dovetail really nicely uh, so that we can actually see if the Norwich Terrier is heading towards brachycephaly or not. Then we will describe the pathology in affected tissues um, if, if, we, if, we, if we take any from surgery and compare it to normal tissues on file. And we'll also be collecting DNA from all dogs. So let's, I'll go through each of these um, in detail so you, you see how we're going to run the study. Uh, the first objective, okay, the first objective was to develop a standardised severity grading protocol that we can all use, uh, which can help if, if you choose to use it, but by guiding, uh, you know, it'll be up to you guys how you want to use it and, and how you go uh, about it and whether you want to use it to guide your breeding um, practices. Uh, but you can hand it to a veterinarian. Veterinarians should be trained on how to do it. And it's not rocket science. It's just endoscopy. Even an internist can do it. You can tell that to... Linnell as well. Um, and uh, it's just that we have to know what we're looking at and, and what's important and what's not important. So we're going to roll over a period of uh, two years, maybe even earlier, if we're going to get them earlier, uh, 150 Norwich Terrier. And we're going to stratify them into five groups, which will be age stratified. So they'll be less than a year, one to two, three to four, five to seven, and greater than eight years of age. Okay, so that'll be 30 in each group. And all the dogs initially that want to be in the study will be screened 
Uh, we'll go through an informed consent, which is what I was handing around. Uh, we'll, once we've enrolled the study, uh, the dogs, then there will be a red cap. It'll be an online database uh, for a lot of the, a lot of the uh, legwork for you to do first. We'll take some time. The history questionnaire will be online, but then when you come into us, we will go through it again. And then they'll have an endoscopic examination, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So let's, this is the informed consent, and this covers everything, uh, including the second objective, which I'll talk about in a minute. And it really just um, describes what would be, what, what the entry criteria for this study is. And basically, the dog can be any age. It can be clinical or non-clinical. That doesn't matter. It could have had its saccules or not have its saccules out. It could, um, it must not have any other comorbid conditions. So it can't have liver disease or kidney disease or anything like that. It's got to be otherwise healthy apart from its upper respiratory condition. It's got to have normal lung film, though these guys, their hearts do run a little big. Don't worry about that. We know about that. Um, it's got to have normal blood work and so forth. And that will have to be done before we accept them into the study. Um, you'll have to do the online questionnaire, which I'll talk about in a minute, and then we'll corroborate that at the uh, enrolment booking. And so it's getting permission for CT and rhinomanometry because the, some of these dogs will undergo that and also for blood for DNA and upper airway endoscopy. And it just describes what it is um, and talks about the DNA, if we can get it, uh, the, the, the pedigree, if we can get it, which <laughs> my last study with the longitudinal study like this was in, you know, 11-year-old Labradors. And the guys said, oh, yeah, I think we've got it. Hey, hun, where's the pedigree of the dog? You know, I think with you guys, you'll all have the pedigrees readily available. It'll be fabulous. Um, and then it just sort of mentions that um, any surgery that's done is not covered by the study so that would be out of pocket but other things that the blood initial blood work and thoracic radiographs aren't covered by the study either but everything else is the ct the anesthesia the uh, upper airway endoscopy and the rhinomanometry and i'll talk about that in a minute don't worry and then then we just tick off what you're giving permission for and you just say that you've um you've understood what the informed consent is and it's been explained to you. You've probably signed these sort of things before for when you've been in human clinical trials. It's just like signing proxy consent if you're a parent entering a child in a clinical trial, except we don't have the HIPAA and the, uh, all the FDA rules, thank goodness. And then I think one of the questions is where at the very end was we give, you do or you do not give permission for your dog to be used in educational purposes such as tonight. Yeah. So the question was, can the data that we have already on the dogs, um, on the preliminary data, can that be used in the study? Some of it can, which will be great, <laughs> which means we've got a head start. Not as much as I would want, and in fact, I haven't gone through it all yet, but, but I think quite a, a few of them can, anyhow, quite a few of them can. Will you let us know? Oh, don't you worry. <laughs> You'll be contacted, yeah. <laughs> They will be, but not until right at the end, because we can't develop the grading system until we've analysed all of them. She, uh, the, the question was, can they be graded? Yes. I mean, I'm hoping that all the dogs will be graded uh, at the end. So that's a whole idea. So um, then there's this initial history questionnaire, which this is a paper form, but this will be on the red cap, so we'll give you a login, and you'll have your own login for it. Yes. Yes, yes, we can, we can, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, we can go back and grade those via the endoscopy. Um, so uh, then the initial questionnaire will, um, will be done online and then when, we, when you come in for your scheduled uh, enrolment booking, we will then get, log in online with you and we'll go through it again just to make sure it's absolutely accurate. And really try and be as accurate as you can with this history questionnaire because we're relying on you to tell us exactly what state your dog is in um, and so it's really important so we can correlate it to the next step which is the video endoscopy and we do quite a detailed video endoscopy uh, much more detailed than the ones I've just shown you they're sort of edited just so you can see the bits that I wanted to point out but it's quite detailed we record it and then we'll view it offline for filling in the form because we don't want to keep the animal under anesthesia while we're saying hang on I've just got to write this down and what we will do is what I routinely do with these uh, longitudinal studies or with these uh, cross-sectional studies 
is to, uh, we review it offline and then somebody in our uh, research and, and teaching lab, one of the techs, will randomise them and mask them. So we don't know whether they're clinical, whether they're affected or what age they are. We won't even know if they're Norfolk or, or Norwich. And um, though this is just for the Norwich part of it, but, but they'll all be mixed together in the end. And, and we'll send those out in the blinded form to, to Linnell Johnson, to, to Kelly Thiemann, to Eric Monet and myself, and we all grade them. Okay, we all, we all fill in this form, basically, not grading them, we fill in this form. And then we'll run a, a, a test for agreement between observers, a Kappa statistic, and see what sort of um, a, a assessment we have. So the outcomes of this first objective is that um, the final endoscopic results will be correlated to the clinical status of the dog based on the history questionnaire and the physical examination. And then we'll develop this, this NTUAS severity score, which will, be, uh, which will weight various endoscopic features to, uh, to the severity that the dog is showing on clinical signs. And uh, we can report these for each age strata and uh, we may be able to determine then, as we get older and older with the different strata, whether it will, um, whether it progresses if it gets worse as we get, as they get older. But the best thing would be to follow each dog out longitudinally. And from there, we hope to, or we expect to be able to develop an accurate classification and grading scheme that breed clubs and, and veterinarians can do, combining the history and the um, endoscopic examination. So the second objective of the study um, is to compare head and neck CT images between Norwich, Norfolk, brachycephalic and mesitecephalic. We'll also be doing rhinomanometry on them. I should have put that in there. So remember we've got those 150 Norwiches that we have 30 in each of those age groups. Well, we add to that just 25 Norfolk Terriers, split them up into the age groups, not as many. So uh, five Norfolk Terriers in each age group. And in fact, <coughs> we'll just have, we'll take, we'll age match them to the uh, five Norfolk Terriers. So we'll pick five Norwich Terriers, or we'll, we'll probably be doing one and the other. So we, we'll just fill them up in each, um, in each group. And we'll be looking at these, uh, these dogs. So these are 25 dogs, 25 Norwich Terriers and 25 Norfolk Terriers. And we'll be looking at these uh, in combination with the data that we get from another study, which we're actually running right now, which is actually quantifying upper airway obstruction in brachycephalic dogs compared to mesitecephalic dogs. So we've got, the, we've got the 25 Norwich Terrier, we've got the 25 Norfolk Terrier. We'll have 25 brachycephalic, and they'll all be stratified into similar age groups, and then um, 25 mesitecephalic dogs. So we'll be doing the screening, informed consent, enrolment, history questionnaire, endoscopic examination. But what will be different about these 25 Norwiches and 25 Norfolks, from this study's point of view, <coughs> is that we'll be doing CT of the head and neck and rhinomanometry, which is measuring the, uh, the obstruction in the nasal cavity. And I'll tell you how we'll do that in a minute. First of all, the CT um, is a fairly benign procedure. We just sling the upper jaw. Uh, as, they go, as they're, they're sort of heavily sedated and they sling the upper jaw and we just run them through. It takes 30 seconds in, in our 16 slice helical CT and, uh, and we get a beautiful image of their nasal cavity. And so far they've been normal, but I want to prove it. We'll also, because we'll go back far enough, be able to have a good look at their larynx as well, their infraglottic narrowing. So we're going to be looking at um, the turbulent density, and I won't go into the, um, the, uh, the details of this, but there's a specific way of measuring turbulent density, density in these dogs. And we'll, remember, we'll be doing it also with the brachycephalic and the mesocephalic. So uh, the septal deviations, which is the midline bit here, there's a, there's a septum right up the middle, and they're often deviated, especially in pugs. Whether they have those, remember they have those aberrant turbinates that come back into the nasopharynx, well, they also have ones coming up towards the nostril as well. So their caudal or rostral aberrant turbinates, we'll be looking for those, yes or no. The total tongue volume, which is glossal volume. We'll look at the pharyngeal volume and cross-sectional area at certain 
uh, areas. Um, we'll look at the tonsillar volume. I just thought it'd be quite good because these guys have really large tonsils. We'll look at the soft palate length and we'll look at the thickness of it. Uh, we'll look at the position of the hyoid apparatus, which I haven't talked about. It's just uh, what supports the larynx in relation to the, to the jaw, um, the head, I should say. We'll look at that, uh, the narrowing behind the glottis and the cross-sectional area. And we will also do skull indices. I mean, it seems uh, crazy not to if you've got a whole CT there. So the other thing we'll do, and this will be under the same, once we've done the CT, which takes about 30 seconds, then we'll fully anaesthetise the dog, intubate it, and, um, and we'll do the rhinomanometry. And what we're doing here is we're measuring um, nasal obstruction or nasal impedance. And so what we do is we, we block off one nostril, and there are two little incisive papillas here. We've got to block them off too, which we found out in our preliminary data when we did the study, when we, uh, when we did our pilot dogs. Um, so we'll block off those as well. And then we do one nostril at a time. We, we, we have a known uh, velocity of air coming through the, the nares here. In fact, we, it, it, goes, it passes the nares and it's in the nasal cavity. And it's a little, uh, just a little plug that goes in there. And then we have a transducer that's measuring the pharyngeal, uh, measuring pressure in the pharynx. And then we do, we do increasing airflow and, or oxygen flow and we do the other one as well. And um, don't ask me how we're going to interpret that data because uh, Nate does it and I can't understand what he's talking about. So, <laughs> but he does. <laughs> and he's going to look at it. He has this finite element analysis so he's going to model it um, so that he can predict from the CT cross-sectional area how that, um, that they can actually predict the nasal airflow. Um, by just looking at the CT. So we're, go we're going to do, uh, if, the, if, if it's a, hmm. So we're just going to statistically put, compare the data between, uh, of the CTs uh, but, and the rhinomanometry between Norwich Terrier, the Norfolk Terrier, the brachycephalic and the mesotecephalic dogs. Um, I think what we're going to gain from here is first of all, if we'll find out if there is a nasal component. In other words, are, they be are Norwich Terriers becoming brachycephalic or not, uh, and, uh, and that will be, I suspect it'll be no, but I'm keeping an open mind, uh, just based on the CTs that we've done already, and, uh, and we can then sort of nip that in the bud. I should say that most of these dogs, this is how they recover in somebody's arms. These dogs hardly ever hit a cage when they're with us. Somebody at anesthesia says, oh, I've just got to carry him around a little bit, he doesn't like to be put down, you know. <laughs> And I can't come, I'm busy with the dog, I'm recovering the dog, you know, they just, they just, they even come to rounds with us sometimes. So, and then objectives three and four, um, really, uh, although the surgery, any surgery isn't part of the study, if any dogs do undergo surgery, and I will talk about intervention in a minute, uh, then any of the tissues that are collected, the saccules, the soft palate, any supraarotenoid tissues will go to our pathologists any post-mortem tissues, so if you ever have any post-mortem uh, tissues uh, available then, or post-mortem, then uh, just call me or um, email me and uh, we will do as much pathology as we can on these guys. And also we'll get six to eight mils of blood with permission uh, to, uh, so I can extract DNA and I'll bank it and, and along with the pedigree information until Dr. Schoenebeck is, uh, is ready. Um, so that's sort of the study in a nutshell. Uh, we submitted uh, July 25th to the Canine Health Foundation for donor advised funding, which is you guys. Uh, and we got a letter of support from the NTCA. Our budget is actually uh, just under $70,000. Uh, and then of course, as always, there's indirect costs that go straight to MSU, which is another 8% on top of that. And then the Canine Health Foundation charge another 10%. Uh, on top of that for grant management, which as Jane pointed out, you know, if this was an NIH fund, it would be 52%. So I guess it's, you know, I, I sort of resent it, but um, it's, it's a lot less than it could be. Uh, so the total monies um, that we asked from the CHF was 74,497. Uh, we don't, we haven't requested any academic salary support. So all of these um, PIs and institutional investigators are not getting paid to do this because, you know, we get paid pretty nicely anyhow from the university. Of course, not as much as if we were in private practice, but uh, <laughs> so we don't, we, don't, uh, want any, we don't get any salary from that, but th these are basically the hospital charges 
and the tech support. Uh, and I think at this, we're, even at this, we're going to run tight because the different institutions charge different prices for their um, endoscopy and CTs, and we're trying to make it all a, 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 a standardised price. But each hospital, you know, is out there to um, to make a profit. The timeline that we're aiming for, in fact. When I did this timeline, I hadn't actually heard about the grant. Now that now we've got it, it looks like it's going to be perfect. Uh, we're going to do the red cap build, which is putting all the history questionnaire and, and endoscopy information up onto the red cap. I should explain is, is uh, you know, when you're doing large clinical studies, you can do about, I guess you can do up to 50, or even then maybe 30, 35, and you can do it all on an Excel spreadsheet or an access database. After that, it gets really messy and difficult because you've got to cross-reference everything. You've got so many different questionnaires and exams and pathology, and it gets really complicated. Uh, and so, but to, you, to get really good clinical trial software, you know, it's owned by the pharmacologic companies, uh, a lot of that software, and it's incredibly expensive. It's like $26,000 to develop and $6,000 a year to maintain. And I thought I was the only person having this problem, but evidently everybody who was in academia doing clinical trials was having the same, that, that aren't sponsored by pharma, by, by pharmacological companies or industry, were having the same problem. And so Vanderbilt um, have uh, built, Vanderbilt University have built an, a clinical trial online database, and it's fantastic, and it's free. Uh, the only thing is, uh, it's free to those institutions that have bought into it, and most universities have. The only thing is there's a, I think it's a 2,000 something, there's a setup fee and, and then there's a, a maintenance fee for getting the people to train you how to use it and to, to start loading it up and making it. So it's considerably cheaper than, uh, than trying to get any other sort of database. So we're starting to build the REDCap database uh, next week, which is great. Uh, and it'll probably take a couple of months to do that. Uh, and I will actually check with, um, Magda and Jane as we're doing it and maybe we'll get a few of you to just sort of practice putting in some, some, some trial data so that we can iron the tweaks out. Um, and then at that time, you know, over the next probably late October, I think we can probably start uh, screening patients uh, online and or by emailing me and uh, sending out the, the forms so that we can uh, get ready for an enrolment for the first batch in, uh, in November. And we'll go through, uh, we'll recruit these animals through until we, we put them into each strata until we're full. And, uh, and so we'll just keep enrolling them. I imagine that we'll, I mean, I have no idea when we're going to be full. Uh, but I imagine it'll be sometime towards the end of next year. And, uh, and then we can uh, start looking at the data. Um, and then we can publish it. So really... Um, that's the study. And I was just going to finish off with a few minutes just talking about current therapies because I know, although it's not part of the study, it might be relevant to you. Um, from the, the Norwiches I've seen, and I haven't seen hundreds and hundreds of them, uh, but the ones I've seen, I think, uh, and I think the study, as we do more interventions, we'll be able to uh, work out what works and what doesn't work. But certainly, um, it seems that if you modify the lifestyle, which isn't great for these guys because they just love being out, but uh, you know, if you keep them quiet and keep them cool, then they can do fairly well. Um, this, this, I've had some trouble when I've started asking questions, you know, saying, is, you know, is your dog have any respiratory problems? And they say, no, no, he's fine. And I say, well, you know, is it nothing when he's out in the heat? Oh, they're not a hot weather dog. They don't like hot weather. And I'm, ah, well, why don't they like hot weather? You know, or, you know, or, you know he's a winter dog, you know, and... And so it's difficult to actually get a, get a really sort of good feel for whether they're clinical or not. It's been difficult. But certainly they seem to be modifying <coughs> their lifestyle will help. I think maintaining a lean body condition will help. And that's because when we see fat brachycephalic dogs, they often will have this dorsal pharyngeal wall. And so I'm not sure. I haven't actually gone back and related it to body condition score. We will be doing it. We'll be doing it retrospectively with the, or retroactively with the dogs that we have on file, but we'll also be doing it prospectively with the study dogs, so to see if it is related to uh, body condition score. Um, and then the surgical treatments uh, will be followed out, of course, to evaluate effectiveness, which will be a little bit of a separate uh, article or paper or manuscript, but it will certainly be done on the dogs that are in the study. We'll follow them out. I guess, the, the, you know, if, 
if the soft palette is a little bit long, it's probably worth, you know, if it's over a centimetre long, it's probably worth just trimming it off a little bit. Tonsillectomy, you know, I, I think these dogs do have big tonsils. I don't think it plays a role in their upper respiratory obstruction, but if they have chronically inflamed tonsils, which a lot of them do, then that may be something to consider, but not really relevant to this upper airway issue. I think the three main procedures that we'll end up doing is obviously sacculectomy, and in many cases, sacculectomy will make them into quite functional or very functional uh, little dogs. And then there's a couple of other procedures which I'll talk about too, ventral laryngotomy and a permanent tracheostomy. I just want to say that for all of these techniques, even the sacculectomy, which might seem really easy, you should have an experienced surgeon doing this. This is not just a snip-snip procedure, like it is you know, with a, with a brachycephalic, it's quite an easy, you can just go in and snip-snip. Even then, I think you should have an experienced surgeon. But the Norwich Terrier saccules, they're, they're back in there, they're much firmer than the, than the edematous, sort of globose brachycephalic saccules. And if they're not out completely, that they're partial, if they're effaced, we tend to leave them now, though I'm, I'm not sure if even that's the right thing to do, maybe we should tease them out. But if they're partially averted, you've got to tease them out completely with some special laryngeal instruments, and then you need to get special scissors, or you can use a, a diode laser, and get that whole redundant tissue, that whole tissue that's abnormal out. It doesn't matter if you use laser or if you do it with a cold cut, but you have to do it very carefully. If you nick too far back, you will get into the vocal fold, which bleeds like a stuck pig. You don't want to do that. It doesn't bleed like a stuck pig, but it bleeds. And, uh, and also they'll have a change in bark if you nick the vocal fold. So you want to know what you're doing when you do this and remove all the saccular tissue. And I should mention that I'm actually uh, talking about the Norwich Terrier at our big annual surgery meeting in a few weeks time in Nashville. And, uh, and I just said, you know, we've got to talk about this because nobody knows about it and, and they have to. So we've got it first on the program. So that's great. Um, the next procedure is ventral laryngotomy. And this is something that I think with quite severely affected dogs will help them. Uh, now we've, I've done this procedure a lot. It's a, certainly a specialist technique again. I've done it many times because it, it's the surgery we do when debarks go wrong and or there's been some laryngeal scarring from trauma or something like that. We do a very careful ventral laryngotomy. In other words, uh, we do a cut into the larynx from underneath. We open it up very carefully. And this is a magnified view. You're always using magnification to do this. You remove the vocal folds so they won't be able to bark. You remove the saccules and then you suture it together with about with, with, with suture that's a little bit thicker than a hair, very fine. And then what you do is you put a, a suture, and it's a big suture this time, this is the, you're cutting, you're cutting through the bottom of that thyroid cartilage, you know, the one that hugs all the others. And then you, you put a suture, you go down beside the muscle here and you put a suture right through into the lumen around the vocal process of the arytenoid and out again and you tie it down tight and that widens up the larynx. By, the, by lateralizing those vocal processes. Now to do this procedure, you may have to do a temporary trach for a few days. It's a tiny larynx and so you haven't got a lot of room to move but, and the bark will be lost as I said. But it's a good procedure. It's been done in Norwiches. I haven't done one in Norwich but I've done lots of others in other breeds. Uh, Eric's done one in a Norwich and it's probably the only one but that is what I would do if I had a severely affected one that isn't so bad like, like that first one that I had. And for the really badly affected one, or if the ventral laryngotomy didn't improve it, then a permanent tracheostomy is absolutely a viable option. Now, people have put off permanent tracheostomies because they're scared of them, and they're, or they've heard when they haven't been done properly. It is a major procedure, and it is a salvage procedure. And what you're doing is you're allowing the dog to bypass the larynx completely and breathe through its trachea. So probably for the first time in its life, it will be able to breathe without any uh, respiratory obstruction at all. Um, of course, obviously you need to have somebody experienced in doing it. And there is some maintenance because there's a little hole here that's a permanent hole and you just have to give it... My own dog actually has got a permanent tracheostomy because he was going to be euthanized. And I thought, oh shit, I'll just do a permanent tracheostomy and keep him. So, I, so I've had him for the last eight years and I keep forgetting to clean it all the time. So, but I have another little dog that actually cleans it for me, which is great. And everybody thinks it's disgusting, except my kids and, um, and other vets. <laughs> so it's great. I've got videos of it, actually. So, um, but you do have to maintain it. You just have to... 
Um, well, the, 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 they're both pretty small. Oh, so three. Yeah. She goes. <laughs> yeah. What's the breed? I'll show you the video. The, the French bulldog is the one with the permanent trach. It's a pap papillon um, beagle cross is the cleaner. <laughs> She's great. <laughs> so, uh, but you'd, if, if I didn't have her, I would have to just give it a little clean twice a day, just with a moistened gauze, uh, moistened with saline, not water, obviously. Can't go swimming. Have to be very careful if you're bathing them at all. Any, any tap water that gets in there. Saline, quite a bit of saline can get in there. That's fine. They hoik it up. But um, not that I'd put it down there but they can't go swimming, okay? If they get tap water in there or fresh water in there, they will drown immediately, obviously. Um, but it's a great procedure. And in fact, this is, um, oh, this is just some slides in it. You can see what we do is we, we bring the muscle around behind the trachea to push the trachea ventrally or, or downwards closer to the skin. And then we carefully remove um, the ventral aspect or the bottom aspect of the cartilage rings, but we leave the mucosa there so that we can open it out and suture the skin. And that's why you've got to get somebody who knows how to do it because if you just cut a hole in the trachea, it'll close down again. Okay, it's got to be sutured really carefully. You've got to preserve that mucosa. So that's immediately before we take her off the machine. That's next day. And this is her. So this is the one you remember. Wait a minute. So remember her from before in the oxygen cage. Not even exercising. Did you say this was a seven-year-old? Yep, yep. And this is her. Oops, this is her the day after surgery. That's not her. <laughs> no, that was another dog. Now it's a little red still there, and I actually don't have a photo of her. So no, sometimes you can. So the question was, do they dig at it or scratch at it? No, they typically they don't. I mean, in the cold in Michigan, um, this dog and my dog wears a little. I actually use my husband's um, running baklava. I don't tell him, but um, <laughs> you know the the, the uh, fleece that you put around your neck, and just so, so you don't want the cold to get to it. Um, he keeps wondering why it's a little mucky. And, and so from this dog, of course, um, I now see her from being, you know, housebound. I now get pictures from this dog. And, you know, she's now hiking in the Adirondacks. And now she's down in Austin where she could never go before because of the heat. And now she's on Mackinac Island cycling around the island. And honestly, this dog leads a charmed life. And I just, I just live vicariously through her. So... So don't, don't write off temporary tracheostomy. And I can certainly speak to you or your vet. I have uh, lots of presentations and slides on it that I can uh, share with your vet or with you. I'm just curious now that you mentioned, how old was that dog? Seven years old. Okay. Yeah, but then I've seen 11-year-old dogs that are fine. You know, it's just variable. So in summary, <laughs> second to last slide, uh, this is a big study. We've got 175, right? We've got 150 Norwiches, 25 Norfolks. Um, the relationship between our study group and you and your, and your dogs, obviously, is, is critical. Uh, I can guarantee that uh, everything will be confidential. All these pictures here um, have been used with permission and they haven't been named. Everything is identified by their NTL number and only I uh, have access to that enrolment log. Um, the, it's, it's really important that the communication between the breed club and, and the study group uh, is uh, frequent and open and I think the best way to do that is to have it organised uh, you know, through either some focus groups that, is, that are run by um, uh, your health committee chairman or your chair so that we can optimise efficiency. I can travel a certain amount to come and meet and discuss with you and see uh, how things are going. So I'm really invested in this, in this study. I, I think this is an incredibly interesting condition. I love these dogs. <laughs> in fact, everybody loves these dogs. I really would love to see these dogs free of their laryngeal problem in the next uh, five years or so. And I think if we work hard, we'll, we'll certainly um, get some answers that will lead us towards that, especially once we get the genetics going as well. But once we, once we have the grading scheme uh, accurately characterised, we can start 
uh, working towards that. And you know, this could be a shining example of how breed clubs and clinical researchers work together and the Canine Health Foundation will say, well, look at that Norwich Terrier study, wasn't it great? All right then, thank you very much for listening to me. I hope I haven't gone on too long. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So the question was, could I mention the website and the geographic locations for it? So, um, you, so we have this pamphlet. In addition to this pamphlet, we'll also have a, a, a two-sided uh, handout, client handout that's being developed at the moment. But this is just to advertise the study. The uh, locations are, we're trying to spread it around the country so we get an even sort of mix of uh, dogs from different lines. And so we have uh, UC Davis. Obviously, obviously over in Davis, California. We have Texas in the south. We now have Colorado uh, in the mountains. We have Michigan State, which is the central one. And we have, we were just discussing earlier tonight the possibility of opening up uh, somebody here on the west coast. Certainly I've got uh, east coast, whatever. So <laughs> the, one, the one away from Australia. <laughs> and, uh, and actually it doesn't make much difference really. So, um, so, uh, and, and you know, I certainly have collaborators uh, in the past at, at and David Holt at uh, Penn and uh, I've got AMC, some collaborators at AMC that might be interested in it and, uh, and certainly in practice in Manhattan as well. So if you have any, um, I did write to Sadanaga, Ken Sadanaga, uh, about six months ago. I could try and write to him again because he's quite busy in private practice, but he's, he knows about these guys. So there is the possibility of that. The other possibility is, of course, I, I'm planning on going down to Texas and we're going to spend a week down there doing, doing the Texas dogs and uh, might get a pair of boots or something. And then, <laughs> and then I, can, I can certainly go. I don't need to go to Davis because Linnell's got everything under control there. Eric will have everything under control at Colorado. Um, and uh, I can come out east here as well and uh, supervise, you know, 30 so dogs. You, you can only do about five dogs a day, doesn't well, at Michigan State, we can do, I think, a maximum of about four or five, but, you know, a everything a day, a day. And that, but that's because everything just goes so slowly at State because we're a teaching institution and anesthetist has to check everything 20 times. And, I mean, it's just painful. But we're very thorough, you know, nothing ever no. dies on our watch. But it's, it's just, it, you know, I, I'd imagine it would probably go quicker at other institutions. Oh, not at universities. Universities are slow. So no so if more. someone came out of from out of state with fifteen dogs, then there would we'd get to them over three days. days. Yeah, it would take three days. Yeah, but there's plenty of room in the car park for an RV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, if, the, if you had dogs that went into the prior study and then get the feces or an oxygen the right oxygen, do they get that little piece of the mesh so it can work in the study? So the question was, if they come into the study but they weren't selected for the rhinomanometry and the CT. Um, could they get it at the end of the study? They were, I took five dogs in last November. Right. They did not get the, that funding in their house right. at that point. If yep. I take them back, do you do that? Can yes, we, them yes them? we could add them We could add them to the study. Now, the thing is, I, I don't think it's going to be a very... I don't think it's going to... Well, it will tell us what they don't have. And it may tell us something. But, you know, so far they've been really boring, which is good. It's great for them to have boring noses, you know. But uh, so I don't think I don't think for, for your dog individually it wouldn't be a good thing. It'd be fantastic for the study though. It'd be great for the study because we could slip them right in. We've already got the endoscopic data on them. Yes. For the dogs that you examine that have something wrong, uh, I know that you're the surgeon. Could you correct them then, or do they have to come back? And Usually, good question. So the question was if they've got something that's surgically correctable at the time of endoscopy and, and evaluation for the study, would we go straight ahead and do the surgery? Typically we do because it saves having to re-anesthetise them and they're already under anaesthesia. But then of course that would slow down the rest of the day so we, we, we'd, uh, you know, we'd have to take that into account. But yeah, I mean it's stupid not to. Right. Um, and, and unless it was something like a ventral laryngotomy, right. uh, which would take a little bit longer and, um, and I'd like to plan for. So in that case, we'd probably do them the next day. Yeah. Yes. Have you ever ex examined uh, a Norwich that had had prior surgery? I wondered if, if it's grown back. 
so the question was, we ever examined a Norwich that has had prior surgery and if the saccules have grown back? Yes. Yeah, a lot. And, and they have grown back. Now, the thing is, thing is, I'm not sure, it, yes, though they, they have. I've had, I've had, in fact, there was one dog uh, that, uh, that had had surgery a week earlier and came back and the saccules were huge. And I actually called the vet that did them and they said, what did you do? <laughs> Show me the endoscop endoscopic view. And, and um, I, 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 I mean, he, he must not have got them all out. So because you do what you're saying, because I know several, that's happened to several people. Yes. So I'm not sure if they weren't done properly or if they truly do grow back. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So don't I don't know. know. I don't think I've had any of mine grow back. I'm sure people would call me, but I don't know. Exactly, and, and so we need to determine, that's why we want these five people to do them. You know, so we either want Eric Monet to do it, or myself to do it, or Kelly to do it, or Linnell to do it, or and they, maybe David Holt, you know, whatever. Because they will all be done exactly the same. Because they will be done the same. I trust these people to do a good job. And, it's, and they're difficult. They're not like normal brachycephalic dogs to do. You've got to really get in there, and they've got longer noses too, so you've got to get right back there with really specialised laryngeal instrumentation. You can't just use fine instruments, you've got to use specific laryngeal instruments. So I can see that they, if they're not taken out properly, they would just start. But maybe they, even when they are taken out properly, may they grow back again. I don't know. Are there no other vet institutions that you all are considering using? I would like to use more institutions. So the question is, I'd like to use more institutions, and there are quite a few institutions that are good. It just gets a little unwieldy in my experience of doing multi-site studies of making sure that everybody uh, conforms to the protocol. One, because you know, it's not their study. You know, it's, they're just an institutional PI. So you've got to be really careful. And this is about the maximum number of institutions that I'd want to use without losing control. But good question, yeah. I mean, human studies do many, many sites. Doctor, just as a, <coughs> as a segue to that last question, um, we have a, a, not a regular veterinarian, but on referral to an emergency 24-7 emergency facility on Long Island where I live. And uh, they uh, put themselves forward. I'm not in a position to evaluate it as having a UA, an emergency, um, upper airways practice. Uh, I'm familiar with it myself. But the question is this. Would you comment on the following? Um, they use equipment um, called ligature harmonic. Oh, salvage. ligature, yeah. Mm. Would you please comment on that? Because okay. I'd, I'd appreciate your your assessment of that as a tool. Absolutely. So we have a ligature as well. It's a harmonic scalpel which is based on a high frequency ultrasound to, um, to heat up the tissues and coagulate them. And it's very effective for various surgeries. Now, we did use it once in a soft palate. And the reaction that I got from that, and I didn't actually do it, it was one of my residents. He said, I'm going to, he was from Austin. He said, I'm going to use the ligature for this. And I said, you sure? And he said, yeah, I think so. And, and anyhow, it swelled up really badly. And I have not used, I don't use electrocautery in the mouth. And I don't use um, anything that causes heat in the mouth because of the propensity, or, or the respiratory tract anywhere, because of the propensity for swelling that can occur. And then you've got obstruction, you've got to do a temporary trach. So I would either use a cold, cold scalpel, or if I had a diode laser, which is different than a normal CO2 laser, because you actually have to touch the tip to the tissue and it sort of vaporizes it. That would be reasonable. But, and it's very focal. It doesn't disseminate the heat like a ligature does or like electrocautery does. So I, I don't, but I know some vets do use a ligature for their soft palates anyhow. They can't use it for the saccules. So um, well, I guess if they got the small, there's a small um, forcep in, that would be interesting. I don't think so. Yeah, so so I personally do not like using the ligature, and I won't. I now won't let my residents do it. So that that's. But there are vets that do, and they're probably uh, surgeons that do. It'd be an interesting discussion to have at ACVS actually when I'm there.
I'll bring it up. Yeah. Well, good, good question. So what is going to be the cost to um, the uh, participant uh, that isn't covered by the study? So if you do the blood work beforehand and the thoracic you know, chest x-rays beforehand and they're normal, then we, and it's within a month, then we won't repeat them. Um, everything else will be covered by the study. So the anesthesia, and it's all in the informed consent form, the anesthesia, the CT and the endoscopy are covered, and if it says rhinomanometry if, and, um, uh, and CT, sorry, and endoscopy, anesthesia and endoscopy. Uh, the questionnaires obviously won't cost anything. The, the only thing that would cost more would be if your animal, if we recommended that your animal undergo a surgical procedure. And then of course, it could be something like $2,000, you know? So, um, Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, I, w I would imagine if it requires surgery, it would be, could be anywhere between 1500 and 2000 because some of the anesthesia would be taken off. But, you know, it would be a night in CCU and everything. Yeah. What dog do you want in the study? Because are you going to get people who pet, or, or is this only going to be for, like, breeders? No, I would like... So if we know of a Norwich Terrier, do you know how to be? Or a Norfolk. Or a Norfolk. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I would like, I mean, obviously, from the uh, point of view of running the study, I would like to get a good cross section. But we'll just start filling up each age age strata, and and once one's full, once we've got thirty dogs in, you know, the three to four age group, whatever it is, then then we don't include if your animals in that age group. Advantageous for Norfolk's really. This is just a comparison. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, the it's going to be harder to get the Norfolk owners because. You know, why would they do it? You know, to help Norwich breeders, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's, a, there's quite a few Norfolk with us. That's what I'm hoping, yeah. yeah. Now, the other question is, um, do we take dogs that have not had their saccules out or that have had their saccules out? And I think there, we've seen so many that have had some sort of saccule surgery that we will have to include them, but it's certainly one of the questions in the, in the questionnaire. Well, we're going to admit 30 in each age group, each of those five age groups. Once we've filled up one of the age groups, then we won't admit any more into that age group. What is the oldest age group? Greater than eight. Okay. Yeah. Mm. All right. Oh. What, what, is, yeah. what is the safe, like, we have a 15 year old that sounds like it's in bad shape. Would you feel like that's a safe age? So the question is, you know, if you have a 15-year-old, is it safe? Now, I get this question all the time because I operate in a lot of aged animals. And old age itself isn't a disease. If the chest radiographs are good, the heart sounds good, the uh, blood work is good, um, we may get a cardiac consult. But if anesthesia is happy, then I'm happy. And okay. yep. So we, we don't lose animals unexpected. We, we see a lot of trauma, but, you know. The, no, we just didn't know. Okay, one more question, and then I'm happy to talk to people afterwards. Yes. Right, we would like to get a cross section. Oh, I'm so sorry. Are we interested in family groups? So what we would like to do is not get a whole lot of dogs from one line, which is why we're trying to go at, at all these different places around the country. Uh, I, I, I think what we'd like to get is a true characterization of a cr large cross section of the breed in North America. Well, in the US, <coughs> basically, yeah. West coast to the east coast, the south, and yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thanks very much, and I'm here all night. <laughs>
on Michigan State University, we will have a, a nor, an NTUAS website uh, with all the information, including all the brochures and so forth on it. Thank you so much. And a big thing for everybody, because it is a big issue, and we really need to throw our weight behind it. It is going to be completely funded by us. Uh, although we did get a grant, that grant allows certain, you know, um, some money from CHF, but, but with the caveat that most of it will be from our club, from the fundraising specifically for the grant. Once I have the grant number, you will be able to go and, you know, we'll send this information, we'll be able to go to CHF and donate online, you know, and that will be a tax deductible donation. Or right now, you can go to that website at MSU and donate directly to Norwich Terrier Upper Airway Syndrome study yeah, at sure the university. Safe. Also tax deductible, but you have to designate your donation that it's going specifically to that study. And we'll have also fundraiser. Um, I think Tammy will be telling us all about that, but. Um, Please help us, you know, support it with uh, participation, with getting friends with Norfolk to participate, and with money. Thank you. Thank you.